imagine that after tomorrow, when surf ends, we all celebrate and decide to go to a sushi restaurant, and one of us makes the mistake of putting too much wasabi on our piece of sushi. So when we eat that piece, we start to choke, um, our throat gets sort of itchy, and then our eyes start to water. Our response to wasabi is due to a protein channel called TRIP-A1, and my research over the summer was focusing on how temperature affects certain fragments of that protein. Um, to begin as background, so cells, in order to function, um, need to separate their internal contents from the contents around them um, through a bilayer of lipids. However, they also need to, need to be able to interact with the um, particles around them um, using proteins either on the cell membrane or proteins that go through the cell membrane. Now, many of these proteins that go through the cell membrane um, are called protein channels. Um, and like the name suggests, they have channels or tunnels or pores um, that allow for particles to move, to move through the cell membrane. Um, and then the cells, they, allow, they regulate the flow um, by changing the conformation and opening and closing the pores. Now, trip A1 is a, or the trip, the transient receptor potentials family, is a family of um, protein channels. Um, and as this diagram shows you, it gives you a specific example of the protein channels and then um, the different stimuli that it responds to. So, um, you can see here, this is a temperature gradient, or the temperature scale, and the blocks show which temperature gradient each um, protein, or each specific protein channel responds to from trip. And then down here, it shows the different chemicals that each specific trip um, protein channel responds to as well. One specific um, protein channel, or the trip protein channel we, we focus on was trip A1, which responds to these temperatures, as well as pecan chemicals found in garlic, mustard oil, and wasabi. Now, the structure of trip A1 consists of six trans cell membrane um, protein fragments that extend within the cell membrane. Um, then a portion that extends into the cell that consists of 16 uh, repetitive um, structural repeats that are called anchor repeats. What's interesting about trip A1 is that um, this, its response to a specific stimulus depends on which species of cell that the trip A1 exists in. Um, now, I'll come back to that point later, but first I'd like to um, give you an intro on like anchor repeat structure. Um, and each repeat has two helices that's connected by a linker region. And in this image, you can see that um, these are a set of anchor repeats. And each color represents one anchor repeat. And as we can see, there's one helice here and one helice here. Um, anchor repeats are cool because um, they are modular, and so they can be strung together, um, much like beads on a string. And we can think of those beads in the string and like um, each bead from a different species can be put on the same string and often the proteins can work together. Um, so as we said earlier, this portion is, exists within the cell membrane. And this is the portion that um, regulates ion flow through the cell membrane of the cell that the trip one exists in. Now, uh, um, scientists can use this fact um, by measuring the current that is created once the ions flow through the protein, and then measure the protein function directly. So for example, a scientist can change the temperature on the cell containing trip A1, and this causes the trip A1 to react, open its pores, and for ions to flow through the cell membrane. And this creates a current. By measuring the current created, we can directly measure the function of the protein. This is precisely what um, scientists did in previous uh, research where they look at, looked at human neural cells that contain trip A1 protein channels, and they saw that as temperature increases, um, there is barely any current change, meaning that the human trip A1 protein channel does not respond to temperature, or at least very much. However, in rattlesnakes, um, as temperature increases, there is a large current spike, meaning that the trip A1 um, in snakes does respond, but at least in rattlesnakes. This is interesting knowing the fact that rattlesnake trip A1 has 61% sequence similarity with those of human children. Now this suggests that the other 39% um, sequence dissimilar, dis or not similarity of the proteins is the reason why they have different responses in humans and rattlesnakes. So our question to ask is, then which portion of the trip one is responsible for this difference? Um, and we hypothesize it's the anchor in repeats. Or, or sorry, our previous lab hypothesized that. Um, 
And so the David Julius lab, um, the UCSF, interchanged cross species portions of snake and human anchor reef domains. And so they took anchor reefs of the mouse snake two through eight and replaced those of the human. And then they took another um, anchor reefs 10 to 15 and replaced it in another stream of anchor repeats with those of the human here. So now we have Chimera 16 with anchor repeats two through eight of the mouse snake. And the background is mostly of human anchor repeats. And then for 29, they're mostly of 10. Now they did the same um, experiment where they um, changed the temperature of the cells containing these um, proteins. And they saw that for Chimera 16 and 29, their um, change of current based upon temperature is almost the same that of the cells containing entirely biostic anchor repeats, which suggests that anchor repeats 3 through 8 and 10 to 15 are what specify the response um, in terms of temperature. Because we can look at the human response and really this response. And this is interesting also because most of the anchor repeats here are human. So now that we've identified which anchor repeats specify response to temperature, um, we hypothesize that it's probably the structural conformation um, of the anchor repeats that specify this response. Um, so, if you, so a good way to think about this is, for example, um, if we change the conformation of these anchor or if the anchor repeats um, con social conformation changes differently um, of, of those of the human and those of the snake, it can somehow affect the structural conformation of this transcell membrane protein and um, thus affect the function. To um, identify anchor repeat structure, we use a technique called circular dichromism, um, where in CD spec, we shine circular polarized light onto our circular polarized light or light that rotates in two different directions onto a protein. Um, this image shows um, that circular polarized light, and there's also right. And then proteins, or the helices in proteins, uh, react differently to the two different directions and give us a spectra. And we can use this spectra um, to see if the protein is unfolded or folded at a certain time. But looking at the unfolding of the protein as the temperature changes for the two fragments, we can compare the structure. Um, and if unfolding rate is different, maybe the structure can determine the response. However, for CD analysis, our proteins must be purified and soluble. Um, so the, the problem with that is that um, protein purification is often the limiting step of biophysical studies, uh, and many problems can occur. But the general process is that we take DNA. Uh, which codes for the um, protein of our choice through a process called translation. And we insert that uh, specific DNA into a bacterial cell and make it mimic the process of translation for us, thus making the protein of our choice. We then break open the cell and it's a diffuse sample, and we end up with a soluble material here and an insoluble pellet here. We then uh, separate the two solutions and we hope to purify the protein. Now we want most of our protein to end up in this soluble material because it's much easier to purify the protein from there um, and then to do our CD analysis. So like we said earlier, we found anchor repeats 3 through 8 and 10 to 15 particularly interesting. So we decided to purify those fragments. Um, but we found out that um, those fragments by themselves were not soluble or were not found in soluble material. So a um, technique that many biophys uh, biophysicists use is they add a part of the clock MVP onto the protein of their choice, which helps increase the solubility um, of the protein that they want. And then later on, you can cleave off MVP, and hopefully your protein will still remain in its native conformation and still be solid. Um, so we tried that with um, anchor MVPs of the human 3 through 8 and attach MVP onto them, but we still found that there was barely any um, MVP with H3 rate in the soluble uh, portion, and most of it was in here. So we had no choice but to continue with the insoluble pellet and try to purify the protein from there. But um, luckily, we had success, and we found that we still had um, soluble anchor MVP 3 through 8 from the human once the MVP was cleaved off after we purified it from the insoluble pellet. So now, um, all we have to do is we need to purify some more so then we can perform some CD analysis. However, uh, because of time restrictions over the summer, um, our, if, even though our current process was successful, um, we have to continue with the MVP fusions and try to purify a lot to do seed analysis, but also do MVP fusions for the other um, anchor MVP fragments, 10 to 15 of both the snake and human, and also the snake 
and you're able to sleep through it. If that doesn't work, there are many different methods we can use. We can try doing, um, testing capillary beats, where we add um, portions of proteins on both ends of our desired protein fragment, and hopefully that will increase the sol solubility of our protein. And these are all, quite, or these are all um, methods on trying to answer our end goal on explaining why human and snake and trip rate one responds differently to the same stimulus um, given early in the temperature. Is it because of structure of the anchor? Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone um, who helped me through this project, uh, Professor Susan Marcusi, um, my graduate student research advisor, Diana, um, everyone in the Marcusi lab for their advice and their tips, um, Surf, uh, Nathan Shit, who helped us out through um, the whole summer, and Dr. Carroll and the Westmans Foundation for this conference. Thank you.